Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing cholera and pertussis toxin. Okay, so we're now going to turn our attention to how cholera toxin works. Okay, and as I said right at the start, we're not going to discuss the full pathology of cholera. We're not even going to discuss the delivery of the toxin into the cell. We're going to literally look at what it actually does to uh, heterotrimeric G proteins. Now, cholera toxin is often abbreviated to CTX. Now, TX is for toxin. The C then is just for cholera. Okay, so it's a toxin produced by the bacterium Vibrio cholerae. Okay, and it's one of the major virulence factors of uh, Vibrio cholerae. Now, a virulence factor is just something which um, allows the bacterium to cause disease. So, Vibrio cholerae produces cholera toxin, and cholera toxin is one of the reasons that having Vibrio cholerae colonizing the surface of your small intestine uh, is so uh, dangerous because cholera toxin damages your cells hugely and causes diarrhea. So, it's one of the main virulence factors. It causes disease. So, why does Vibrio cholerae cause disease? Well, one of the reasons is that it produces cholera toxin, and hence the cholera toxin is called a virulence factor. Okay, right. So, what does cholera toxin actually do? Well, basically, it's going to ADP ribosylate. Um, an arginine residue on certain of the G alpha subunits, okay? So it's going to add an, what's known as an ADP ribozyl uh, group onto certain of the alpha subunits of heterotrimeric G proteins. So in order to further understand what I mean by that, we first need to look at the structure of a very important molecule, okay, which is going to be the molecule that we will use to ADP ribosylate um, the um, alpha subunits of heterotrimeric G proteins. And this very important molecule is a molecule called nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. Okay, and some of you might recognize uh, the name of this. This is you more usually just abbreviated to NAD. Okay, and it's the same NAD that is extremely important in the respiratory reactions. Okay, so nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, or NAD for short. So I want to discuss what the structure of NAD actually is because it's going to be important for us to understand the modification that we're going to make to these alpha subunits of these heterotrimeric G proteins. So we're going to start off with the structure of nicotinamide. Now nicotinamide is very related to the structure of nicotine, but it's more closely related to the structure of vitamin B3. Okay, and vitamin B3 has another name, it's also called niacin, okay, and basically niacin consists of something known as a pyridine ring with a carboxylic acid group coming off the side of it, okay. So, a pyridine ring is basically where you take a benzene ring, so a six-membered ring, and you replace one of the carbons with a nitrogen, basically, like so, okay? So, you've now got five carbons and one nitrogen here, okay? But you're, you've still got alternating double and single bonds, like so, okay? And, of course, the nitrogen here won't now need uh, a hydrogen coming off it, because nitrogen, unlike carbon, only needs three bonds to saturate it. So all of the five carbons in the pyridine ring, and that's the name for this, this is called a pyridine ring, all of the five carbons in the pyridine ring will have hydrogens coming off them, but the nitrogen doesn't need that. Okay, so let's now show the structure of niacin. Niacin has one of these pyridine rings within it. So it's got this six-membered ring here with alternating double and single bonds. And then off this carbon up here, it then has a carboxylic acid group. Now I'm going to uh, dispense with the skeletal structure for a moment and just show this uh, via its molecular formula, because carboxylic acid groups actually look scarier when you draw them as their skeletal formula than they do if you draw their molecular formula. And everything's just about trying to make it look as simple as possible. Okay, so this then is the structure of niacin. 
So you've just stuck a carboxylic acid group off the side of the pyridine ring, basically. Now then, how do you get to nicotinamide? Well, basically, you turn this carboxylic acid group from a carboxylic acid group into a primary amide group to create nicotinamide. And nicotine is very structurally related to these, which we won't discuss it, but it is very closely related to them. Okay, so you have, whoops, I've missed that nitrogen. Never mind, uh, I can just put it in like that. Okay, then we've got um, the alternating double and single bonds, and then off this carbon up here, we then have now a primary amide group. So instead of an alcohol group coming off this carbonyl group, you have an amine group instead, and this then is called a primary amide group. So that's the structure of nicotinamide. Okay, so basically, uh, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide is going to contain uh, nicotinamide, and then it's going to contain um, two ribose sugars, one of which will have an ADP molecule bound to it. Okay, right. So, let's begin this structure then. So, um, basically the foundations for the structure of the nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide molecule is that you have two ribose sugars linked by two phosphate groups, and then each of these ribose sugars has something coming off it. So the top one will have nicotinamide coming off, and the other will have um, adenine coming off. Okay, uh, right, so let's do this. So, uh, let's start off with our ribose sugar here. So, let's just have a quick reminder of the structure of ribose. So, ribose has a pentameric ring. It's a five-membered ring. We have oxygen at the top, and then these four carbons here. Okay? Uh, now, basically, the fifth carbon then comes off the side here. Now, you have to be careful, okay, because if you look at all of these four carbons here that are in this pentameric ring, they only have two bonds, so they have two more bonds coming off them. Now, these bonds, one of them will go into the page away from us, okay, in this sort of a direction, and the other will come out of the page towards us in this sort of direction, okay? So, when you have different groups coming off these two bonds, then which one is, how are you going to decide which one should go into the page away from us and which one is going to come out of the page towards us? What I am basically warning you is that there are different optical isomers of ribose, basically. Okay, so the way I'm going to denote this is I will show the group that is coming out of the page as going up and I will show the group that is going into the page as going down. So. Basically, we'll start with these two down here. The alcohol groups, well, each of these carbons here, each of these two carbons is going to have one alcohol group coming off it and one hydrogen atom coming off it. And both of the alcohol groups are going to go into the page away from us. So I will draw them going down like so. If they were coming out of the page towards us, I would have drawn it going up here, okay? Now, I won't show the hydrogens because we're still drawing a skeletal structure here and it'll make the thing look cluttered. Okay, so in ribose, absolutely always you have those alcohol groups going into the page away from us. Then uh, you have the fifth carbon here coming out of the page towards us, so I draw the bond going up rather than down. So the hydrogen that comes off this fourth carbon will be going into the page away from us, and if I drew that, which I'm not going to because we're drawing a skeletal structure, it would be going down from here. Okay, so here's the fifth carbon, and it comes out of the page towards us, at least in D-ribose. Okay, so strictly speaking, Ribose actually means not the cyclic, not the cyclic form. Strictly speaking, what we're talking about is actually ribofuranose. So ribose can exist in two forms. It can exist in a cyclic form, which is what we're drawing, which is the most important form. And it can also exist in a linear form, where it has this bond here broken and it doesn't have the cycle. Uh, and strictly speaking, ribose actually means the linear form. However, in cells, you don't really have that much of the linear form. Most of it is in the cyclic form. And the name for the actual cyclic form is ribofuranose. However, this is a mouthful. So people often just call the cyclic form ribose, but strictly speaking, we shouldn't call the cyclic form ribose. 
Now, there are uh, optical isomers of even ribose, okay? Um, so, we've agreed that these alcohol groups are going to go into the page away from us. That is unchangeable. You can't change that. If you change those, it's, it's no longer ribose. It's called something different, okay? Uh, but, you can actually change the orientation of this fifth carbon, uh, and i.e. whether it goes into the page away from us or comes out of the page towards us. And if it's coming out of the page towards us, which it usually is, then it's called deribose or deribofuranose since we're dealing with the cyclic form. And if it goes into the page away from us, it's called L-ribofuranose or L-ribose. Uh, but um, L-ribofuranose isn't actually present in cells. It's not uh, biochemically found. It's just something uh, that chemists can actually make. Okay, now, more importantly, is the optical isomerism coming off this first carbon here of the ribose, okay? So, usually, if we were just drawing ribose, okay, uh, basically, usually if we were drawing ribose, we'd be drawing the non-cyclic form, we'd be drawing the linear form, so we wouldn't actually have to worry about the optical isomerism coming off here. It's only when you go into the cyclic form, the ribofuranose, that suddenly uh, the groups coming off this, you have to worry about their optical isomerism. Okay, so this first carbon here of ribose is called the anomeric carbon.